Legend Total War here, and today we're going to be doing a tier list using Tier Maker again. Uh, the previous one was was really well received, and uh, it was great that most of the comments were really about the ads that were on the side, not about the actual content. So this time we're in presenter mode, so no ads to post comments about. But that being said, please post a comment, because I think it, that really helps boost it in the algorithm. Um, so we'll see how we go this time. What we're going to do with this tier, uh, tier list is talk about a particular race's recruitable units and rank them based on you know this particular rating that I've, that I've set up here. Um, we're going to start with the High Elves because apparently, according to CA's stuff that they've posted, posted, the High Elves are the most played race on campaign for Total War Warhammer 2. And this rating that we're going to do, be doing here is based off campaign play. It's not based off multiplayer, so don't use this guide here to, to, to build your multiplayer builds. It's a very bad idea. And it's also based around legendary difficulty and very hard battles. Uh, because that's the difficulty that you really want to make sure you're getting a lot of efficiency out of it. If you're playing on lower difficulties and you've got units that you like and that end up me calling them trash, don't worry about it. If you like a unit, you can still make you can make any unit in this game work for you. And if you're happy with that particular unit, you don't have to listen to me one bit. It's totally fine. But if you're playing a very hard battle difficulty, I will try to explain as much as possible why a particular unit ends up in the trash pile. Because um, it's not always just about strong unit equals good, weak unit equals bad. Um, it's not like all tier 1 units will end up here, tier 2, 3, 4, and 5. You can easily sort that crap out yourself. What that comes out, what this will be about is value. Whether a certain unit has loads of bad matchups, or whether it has like infinite good matchups. So that's what it really comes down to. How how many enemies it'll be able to take on the in the that what you'll experience on the campaign map and be able to triumph and triumph well as opposed to get its absolute ass handed to them every single time that you fight. So I just want to make that clear. All right. Let's get into it. So we're also going to categorize it and timestamp everything so that uh, we, it's, it's re relatively well, well organized. So we'll do things in certain categories, starting with like melee infantry, then archers and cavalry, then monsters, that kind of stuff, so that you can look on the timeline for what you're specifically looking for. I hope, hopefully that'll help. Okay, first thing I want to talk about is the, um, is the melee infantry. Now, another thing I want to point out is that I'm probably going to try to go through some of these units quite quickly because... Um, otherwise this is going to end up being like a 60 minute video and I'd like it to try to be more like 20 minutes, which I think I'm going to struggle at just because there's 35 units here to cover. I'm not going to cover any Lords, not going to cover any heroes, not going to cover the regiment of renown. That's separate stuff. We're just going to cover the units that can be recruited in your campaign and that you can get more than one of them. It will also cover the exclusive, uh, faction ones such as the Mistwalkers. All right, talking about the Spearmen first, the most basic High Elven unit. Uh, this one here is a C tier unit. What it really comes down to, uh, while it's very convenient to recruit because you can recruit it from a um, from any settlement at any time, as long as the settlement's not a ruin, um, there, the Archer unit, which is significantly better than it, is also recruited at the same tier, and um, it's, just, it's just a way better unit, and it's cheaper. So... Yeah, I just don't think you need a unit, but need this one. But it's not, it's not like it's not trash. At least it's convenient to recruit. Um, getting a couple of them in your army is not a bad thing. But I would not rely very heavily on them. They won't be your damage dealers. They will not perform well in your battles. You're really just using that to delay the enemy. That's that's it. And it can do an okay job of that sometimes. All right, next up are the rangers. Rangers are a. I'd probably also put it. At, I put a B tier. The biggest problem with rangers is that they are recruited from a military building, right? Uh, this particular building here, which I consider to be really inconvenient, because usually with high elves, I like to prioritize building all my ec economy stuff. So building the stuff here is... Um, I usually go entire campaigns without building it, but at least it's only at tier 1. It only takes one turn to build, so you can just build this, recruit the units, and then demolish it. It's cheaper than archers and spearmen, so that that's why I put them a tier above uh, the spearmen, because they're quite useful in the early game because of the anti-infantry. Most of the armies that you're going to face in the early game are going to be infantry-based, so getting that bonus versus infantry will give you a bit of an edge against them, despite the fact that you're going to be fighting an uphill battle because of the difficulty rating. And if you're playing on very hard or hard battle difficulty, the melee cheats that the AI get are incredibly significant. There's something like 20% extra melee defense, 20% extra melee attack, and 15% extra weapon strength, plus 10 extra leadership, which means their units are going to basically fight to the death, they're, they're going to be hard to hit, and they're going to kick your ass in every single fight that they, that they go into. 
uh, which is why you usually want to avoid fighting in melee. If an infantry unit has special abilities, such as the, the spinning loons like the fanatics have with the greenskins, that's a different story, but if the unit can only go into melee, then it's very difficult for them to do their worth. An anti-infantry unit, though, can maybe uh, close the gap with it, okay? Alright, after that come the White Lion of Grace. So, this is a C-ranked unit. I would have put this under trash a little while ago, uh, because it used to be recruited from a, like, a really separate building, and I just would never build it, so I just never get it. Uh, but now that it's recruited from the same building as Sisters of Avalon, uh, I think it's a C-ranked unit. They've boosted their stats a little bit, and Alistair the White Lion can boost them by a crazy amount. So making a meme stack with them is okay, so I'd say they're a C-ranked unit. Next up are the Silver and Guard. Now, this one here is trash. Now, I'll... Um, I'll explain exactly why this is trash, and then I'll just refer to it as the Silver and Guard um, reason for the remainder of it, because there's a lot of units that will have the exact same reason why they're trash as this one. It comes down to the Silver and Guard is a tier 3 unit. While it is a like a better unit than Spears, um, you've got to take into consideration it is more expensive, and it is a melee infantry unit that's at the same tier as Lothan Sea Guard, and, like, you will have way better archers before you've got them. And it's just... It comes down to you've got better units in your roster. Um, these guys here have to fight an uphill battle against everything except for, like, cavalry. Which, as the High Elves, you really don't need to be too threatened by cavalry charges. Even if you've got an entire army full of archers. There are formations that you can do that make cavalry just not really that big of a different uh, deal. So you don't really need to worry too much about getting silver and guard, which is why I, I'm calling them trash. So it, it really comes down to most of the units in this particular build chain here are going to be ranked pretty badly just because this is such an inconvenient building. You don't need it for any technologies. You used to, but you don't anymore. Uh, you don't need it for any technologies. Uh, and there's just, you really want to be focusing on some of the economic buildings and the hero increasing buildings, such as the Sisters of Avalon one, getting the Handmaidens, the, uh, the one over here that gives you nobles, and the ones that gives you wizards. Those kind of buildings need to be prioritized, like, a lot. Uh, okay. So that's why I've put uh, the... Um, them here. It's not that they're a bad fighter, it's that they're inconvenient and you've got better units. It's just as you, basically you're covered by other things. They're sort of like a, a superfluous unit, I should say. Alright, next up is the um, the uh, Swordmaster of Hoth. Now, this one has been argued to be one of the strongest melee infantry units in the game. And guess where I'm going to put it? Pfft, trash. Do you know why? Because I can agree that it is one of the strongest melee infantry units in the game. But... It is also a tier 4 melee infantry unit. Now, by tier 4, you've unlocked most of your roster. You can use you can use way more advanced tactics than melee infantry by that point. Uh, they're also hugely expensive. Like they are th like nearly three times as expensive as an archer unit. So you've got to take your finances into consideration in terms of cost effectiveness. And um, they're they're even like more expensive than Sisters of Avalon, and I would much prefer a Sisters of Avalon over a Swordmaster of Hoeth. So, while I would have access to the building, I never recruit this unit. Unless there was some sort of desperate emergency where I needed an anti-infantry melee unit, like, desperately, which is extremely rare. But, the thing is with them, is that they punch down, they don't punch up very well. They're good against infantry versus infantry matchups, but that's not something that you should really be sweating about. What you really need to be worrying about are like monsters and magic and heroes by that point. So by the time you recruit these units, you don't really need them. So for high level play, I really don't like Horde Masters of Hoeth. Um, it really just comes down to melee infantry. It's, it's, it's melee infantry... The, the melee cheats that the AI get is uh, it's uphill battle every single time they fight, and you'll be lucky to get like even trade offs sometimes. If you're playing on lower battle difficulties, they'll they'll do just fine. They'll, they'll perform fine. But on very high battle difficulties, I find that they get wrecked a lot, and they don't hold the line long enough to warrant being a good defense for um for um for your archer based armies because they're 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 sort of like a one pump chump. They just don't last long. 
Uh, next up come the Phoenix Guard. For basically the same sort of reason, they're going to be under trash as well, because they're, they're a tier 5 unit, right? By the time you're at tier 5, you should just be way beyond even thinking about melee infantry. Now, I used to recruit a lot of uh, Phoenix Guard in my armies. If you look at my earlier playthroughs of uh, the High Elves, I used to get them, and they would always perform pretty damn badly. And I started phasing them out over time, and my results kept getting better. And I never looked back. Uh, them being at tier 5 just makes them such an inconvenient to re recruit. Even if they do have 30% physical resistance, that that there just doesn't compensate for just how expensive, how long it takes to get them. By the time you're at tier 5 by uh, with High Elves, you, should, you generally speaking are like the dominant force in the world. Well, you should be if you're a good High Elf player. And, you know, to say that Phoenix Guard are at the same tier is, as Arcane Phoenix, uh, what a joke. Um... Unfortunately, I just don't feel like, due to the battle difficulty stuff, that they perform very well at all. Um, so that's why I put them in trash. I don't recruit these three units here ever, and I never have any problems with it. And whenever I do recruit them, I'm very quick to disband them or they just get killed. They're just badly performing units. So that's the infantry stuff done. Whoops. Uh, that's the infantry stuff done. Um, weird to think that the, uh, the rangers are the highest tier one of them, but that's how it is. At least in terms of my recce. Also, don't let my opinions here be like telling you how to play. If you want to recruit Phoenix Guard because you like Phoenix Guard, go for it, you know? You can totally make it work. When I first played the High Elves, I recruited Phoenix Guard and I won the campaign. I just didn't do a good job, that's all. So that's all it really comes down to. You can make any of these units work. It's just that some of them are going to have, have a harder time at it. Alright, Archers. A tier. These are some of the most convenient, best performing units in the game. Like, for their cost... Like, they are one-third the price of these units here, and you can get a unit of archers to defeat a Phoenix Guard because they're faster than a Phoenix Guard. Phoenix Guard can't catch them, and you can thin them out with the amount of ammo and range that they have quite easily. So, yeah, an archer unit can beat a Phoenix Guard unit and beat a, um, a Swordmaster of Hoeth unit. Because uh, they're just faster than them and they've got so much ammo. The, um, the archer being able to be recruited from anywhere just makes it really convenient and you could use them well into the late campaign and still do a good job but of course when you start going up against armored enemies you're going to start to struggle a little bit so it, they're ranked based on their value they're not a tier 5 unit they're a tier 0 unit essentially and they're an amazing tier 0 unit so that's why they're ranked so high now the uh, the armor armored variant i'm going to put it at b tier because even though it's slightly better their missile capabilities are exactly the same but they're recruited from that military building that I previously said. It's a silver and guard problem. That's why they're getting a bit lower tier. But they're still a good unit. If you've got access to them, I'd get them if you've got the money. But in the early stages of the campaign, I'd prefer to just go full cheap. And just cheap out on those. That's my thoughts on, on that one. All right, what comes after that? I think it's Lothurn Sea Guard. All right, regular Lothurn Sea Guard. I'm going to put that at A tier. Now, I would have, a few years ago, put it under trash because I used to hate them. But I used to judge it just based on their stats. I used to look at them as an archer unit and see that they had lower range than regular archers. I'd be like, well, I'll just get regular archers. But also as a spearman unit, they sort of weren't as good as spearmen because they had lower entity numbers. It's like, if we have a look, I think it's like 90 or 100 compared to um, 120. Um, but as a hybrid unit, they're really good. Now, the thing is, there's a tier 3 unit if you recruit it from the uh the port or a tier two unit from the barracks now i don't recruit it from the barracks ever um the thing is you're gonna have loads of ports playing as high elves so with loads of ports it'll re reduce the global duration uh, sorry global recruit duration of lost and sea guard really quickly so you can recruit these guys in the late campaign very easily and they're a good replacement for archers even if they are you know a bit more expensive they are a very good unit and i've in the past, I guess I've treated them quite unfairly, but yeah, I'm quite like Lothurn Seaguard now. Now, in terms of the Lothurn Seaguard with shields, I'm going to put them at B rank. It's the Loth, it's sorry, it's the uh, Silver and Guard problem where they're not recruited from the port; they're only recruited from this military building. If you've got access to it, by all means, but they're less convenient than when you don't need an additional building to get it. For every additional building that you need to build to recruit a certain unit, it definitely makes it. Like, it lowers their value because you've got to put more resources into getting it. But it is, in terms of its performance here, if it was just not quite as... If it was just a bit more convenient. But still, good unit. Like, there's nothing wrong with being B-ranked. 
but I think these ones here are just... Usually when I'm recruiting an emergency army in global, I'm going with uh, Loth and Seaguard, the regular ones. Because um, these ones here usually take two turns to recruit in global, and these ones one. So I usually want to recruit a lot faster. There's a big difference when, you know, you're in an emergency situation in one turn recruitment in terms of... Uh, compared to two. Which will come into play in a moment when we're talking about... Um, these two here, the Shadow Walker and Shadow Warrior. This is specifically for Nagarith. So, for Nagarith here specifically, I would put these two like this because even though Shadow Walkers are better than Shadow Warriors, Shadow Warriors being able to re recruit in one turn compared to two makes them so much more convenient. Uh, if you're if you've got plenty of time and nothing's going on in your campaign by all means get this But I was able to run my Alithanar campaign running with these guys here the entire campaign without I don't think Alithanar ever lost a single battle and I never recruited a single one of these You just basically just didn't need it. They are better units But you will have a better campaign experience if your army is more active and not sitting around recruiting doing nothing for a long time They're also significantly more expensive So I put it under B tier now if you weren't playing as Nagareth I would put this also under B tier Simply because of the silver silver and guard problem because if we have a look at it This unit is not recruited at tier 1 in Lothurn. It's recruited at tier 3 and as a tier 3 unit, it definitely performs well. It's just that it's part of this goddamn building chain here that is, like, it's just such an inconvenient building. Just every other building provides more value. And that's why I would put it under uh, under B rank. All right, so that is almost all the archers. Now we're talking about Sisters of Avalon. Of course it's going to get Doomstack. The thing about Sisters of Avalon is not only do they have amazing stats, um... But they're really quite convenient to recruit, especially if you're um, if you're playing as as Avalon, right? So you want to be building this building up here to get access to the Handmaidens. Um, they definitely perform at a tier four level, and having their base cost at two hundred and twelve gold, that's really bloody. Hang on, hang on a second. What difficulty is this particular campaign that I've jumped into? Yeah, this is um, legendary difficulty. I think this is somebody else's disaster campaign, I'm not sure. Uh, oh yeah, it would be, because normally it would be... This is on large unit scale, I always play on Ultra. Anyway, so if you just look at their stats on their own, don't seem that great, but if you look at the tech tree and all the different ways that you can boost them, there is so much stuff in here that boosts Sisters of Avalon. And if you get Handmaidens with the Resistant trait, which boosts, you know, all your infantry, but you can really make the Sisters of Avalon, instead of having 38 melee defense, they, I've easily seen them get up to 68. But the the um, the missile strength of them being armor piercing, see the, the High Elves don't have a lot of armor piercing archers. Most of their archers are just like non-armor piercing, right? Uh, but these are the first ones that they get that's um, armor piercing, at least with non -Uvress. Um, the only weakness, I think, to the Sisters of Avalon is the fact that they do fire and magic damage. And that just means that there's some units out there that they need to be very careful about fighting. Specifically, like, Iron Drakes and, um, uh, what's it called? Uh, Dragon Princes. Now, Dragon Princes, you should never fight as the High Elves because they, um, <laughs> you, you shouldn't be fighting other High Elves. So it just shouldn't be a problem. But yeah, Iron Drakes as the, uh, the Dwarves, maybe be a little bit concerned about using it. But I... I've seen Sisters of Avalon Doomstacks pull off some amazing victories because you just boost them so much. They're an excellent unit. They're really good in melee. They don't need any support. I, what I used to do was run like six of these and six of these, and then these would always perform really badly. And so I just phased them out for more of them. And then m magically against every enemy, my uh, battle results just kept getting better. I would take less casualties. I would get fewer Pyrrhic victories and get more decisive victories. Um, and... Uh, you can eventually get to the point where globally recruiting them only takes one turn. And thanks to Alariel, you can locally recruit them at one turn as well. Um, but if without Alariel, it only takes... It, it does take two turns to recruit them, which does make them a little bit inconvenient. But they're a very good Doomstack unit, and at Tier 4, highly recommended. Okay, I think that's sorted out for the Archers. So that means we're moving on to the Cavalry now. Okay. So... Let's talk about... I'll cover the Mistwalkers uh, at the end. So, talking about the Illyrian Reavers first. Okay, this is a trash unit. It uh, doesn't have good melee capabilities. It's... Where, where is it even recruited from? Um, 
It's recruited from the cavalry building. I very rarely ever build the... No, I should say I never recruit the cavalry building. Doesn't provide any economic value. All four of these units here are just really inconvenient, essentially. Um, just because I just... Building that building is just, it's just a waste of a build slot, really. Um, that's what it comes down to. They're very bad in melee because of the melee cheats the AI gets. They'll oftentimes lose against enemy archers just because of veterancy. Um, just, you've got better options. Then we've got uh, the Silver Helms, which again, the same problem. They're just, all variants of the Silver Helms are trash. They just don't perform as well as other units. Um, you can make them work if you if you really work hard with them. You can get some kills. And, it, you know, they can inflate their kills when the battle is over, when units that aren't fighting back, you're running them down. But look, Legend, I got 300 kills on my Silver Helm! You know, against units that weren't fighting back. That's great. That's of no value to me. In fact, there's no value to the game as well. They don't gain experience running down uh, broken units. Um, I only care about the units that are fighting back. You have to get the army losses first. And the thing is, I value the units that get the army loss, which is the archers. They they do all the heavy lifting, and then these guys here, they get like, oh, all the easy kills, they're mine. And, and then end up getting more kills than the archers but they didn't do the hard work so they definitely uh rank all of those uh, melee cavalry there as trash okay but then if we're talking about uh chariots though starting with the uh the tyrannoc chariot here oh wait no it's the ithamar chariot hang on i get i oftentimes get them confused let me just double check that it is the uh ithamar chariot is the melee variant right all right let me just go back all right the ithamar chariot um, this one here is not too bad, and it's not as inconvenient to recruit as them, because I do build that, that artillery building, so I would say the Ith uh, Ithamar Chariot, I'd, I'd put a C, um, bit micro-intensive, you gotta keep an eye on it, but their mass allows them to really truly be a good anti-infantry unit. Now, the thing is with Chariots is that, um, if they take like 50% of their damage, and don't get any entities killed, then you end the battle, you'll be back at full strength. So they're very durable along a, like a lot of chains of battles. So that's really good as long as none of them gets killed. So you just have to be very careful about that. Because once they get low in health, you really want to pull them out of combat. And if they haven't delivered their value by then, well then you risk the unit entirely. And it could be an inconvenient unit to recruit as well. Um, and then we've got the uh, Lion Chariots, which... Um, I'd probably put it under the same category. Basically, we've got the anti-infantry or the armor-piercing variant. Um, more expensive. Just, it's just basically the same sort of unit as this one. It's just stats are different, and the cost is relative to their stats. But in terms of performance, they perform at the same... They, they have the same role. It's just that this one here is slightly stronger, but also more expensive. So you just got to weigh up uh, which one you want more. All right, so I think that's uh, the melee cavalry sorted out. These guys here... Uh, the wolves are actually considered war beasts. So now we're talking about the missile cavalry. We'll start with the Ill Illyrian Reaver archers. Now, um, with the Illyrian Reaver archers, the problem with them is that they're recruited from this building here. There's nowhere else where you're going to get them, so that makes them kind of inconvenient. But they're not a bad unit. Unlike the, um, unlike the uh, what's it called, the uh, Illyrian Reavers. They're a the truly piece of crap. Um, these ones here can be very good, so despite them being part of that building chain, I'd actually put them at... Ooh, I'd put them at C tier. No, I'd put them... I'd put it at B tier, because they... These are some of the best horse archers in the game. Inconvenient to recruit, but if you do have access to it, like you capture a settlement, the building's already there, and you need some extra units in your army, I wouldn't turn these guys away. You can get a lot of value out of them. They can be boosted a fair bit in the tech tree because there's a tech that increases excuse me, uh, increases their range. You can really do a lot with it, so it's not a bad unit at all. I'd put it under B tier. Uh, same thing with the Tyrannoch Chariot. This one here is actually more convenient than the... Um, you know what? I, just, I actually put that as A tier. I usually don't personally recruit that, but if we have a look at this... Um, they're tier 3, so actually lower tier than the melee unit. It's just that they have lower melee stats, right? But the Tyrannoch Chariot, you know, they've got 50 ammunition, 165 range. They've got the same range as uh, Lotho and Seaguard. Uh, recruiting them at tier 3, you could... That's pretty damn good value, I think. Yeah. Just, uh, you know, just don't throw them into melee. 
Uh, again, this is on large unit scale, this particular campaign. I just loaded up the first one I could find. Um, so yeah, I'd actually put that one under A tier. I didn't really think too much about that. I usually don't use them, uh, just because there's other units, but I think, I think you could actually get a lot of value out of them. Anytime I do use those units, you can, um, I don't know, I, maybe I, <laughs> I'm leaning towards somewhere between A and B. Maybe I should have done A+, plus, B+, plus, and all this kind of stuff, I don't know. Uh, but yeah, I'm going to leave it at A tier. If you if you like cavalry, I would say that this is probably the best cavalry unit in their roster. Oh, you know what cavalry unit I did forget? Dragon Princes. Pfft, crap. Same problem as as uh, Silver and Guard, really. It's, uh, what is it, tier 5? Um, where is it? Yeah, it's recruited the dragon building at tier 5. Like, I would never recruit a dragon prince over a sun dragon. Dragon princes should not be tier 5. They should be tier 3, really. Um, they they lose so many of their matchups on very hard battle difficulty. Really inconvenient unit, highly expensive. Um, I think in Imric's campaign, when he gets that place of bones, whatever it is, that allows him to... Uh, build these at tier 3. That's okay. That's acceptable. I would say that for Imric, it'd probably be B ranking because it is very good against Clanition. But by the time you're getting into late campaign, man, these guys fucking suck. Um, so many times it's just like trying desperately to find some kind of matchup for them that they can beat because there's so much anti-large in the game and even against like regular non-anti-large infantry they kind of perform, ba perform badly they don't have any bonuses versus infantry or bonuses versus large uh, i'm fairly sure let me just double check that yeah it's just it's just stats uh they're not specifically armor piercing like their stats aren't even good for their price sure, sure they got physical resistance but i don't know i I've never seen them do well. Even for with people that, that said they like Dragon Princes, I just never see them do a good job. The only time they do a good job is if they're just running down in infantry units after they're broken, which, again, just get yourself one of these, or, or even these, or even these for that. So I'm definitely putting Dragon Princes as trash. Okay, so I think that's all the cavalry sorted now. Next up is the War Beasts. So I'm going to start with the Eagle. Now, the Eagle used to be really inconvenient to recruit because it was recruited at tier th that tier 3 building. Um, this one here. But now they lowered its tier down to tier 2. And I've also learned how to use it a lot better. Using swooping attacks, that's where you charge down in an infantry unit and right before you land, you go back up, give it a move order. It'll still end up doing its damage down to it. It's, it's tricky to do. Sometimes you'll end up landing, but it's very useful. But the main use of it is to harass enemy uh, archer units. So you, you send it up ahead of the enemy army that's coming at you. It's got lots of archers. And just stand out in front of it. And while the enemy melee infantry march towards your army, all their archers are hanging back trying to shoot the eagle. Very useful against the AI. The AI gets duped by it all the time. So I would put it under B tier. Now, I would normally get a noble with a eagle mount over an eagle, and I would put the noble on an eagle mount there, but we're not ranking heroes here. But I think it's a good unit. Getting a couple of them in your army is definitely good, uh, but I wouldn't. I would definitely wouldn't spam a full army of them, because it, it has one specific role, maybe a couple, but it, it has trouble defeating entire armies by itself. You've got to really work hard to do that. Um, as for the war lions of Kreis here, these ones, uh, they're okay. I, I wouldn't put them under trash. I'd probably just put them under C tier. They're sort of like a better variant of this. They're like an inf inf infantry unit that's really cheap. Um, does a bit of damage. Can't really take on a lot of units. Um, good at running enemy units down, but not a whole lot of value with that. So that's where I'll leave it. Okay, next up, uh, Flames by a Phoenix. I'd say that it's sort of same tier as... As, uh, as uh, the eagle there, the thing about the Flamefire Phoenix is that it's a tier 4 unit as opposed to tier 2. Like, it's definitely better than an eagle, right? Because um, it can, you know, drop the fire bombs on it, which is really useful. And having fire resistance is really good as well. Um, but it's... I, I definitely wouldn't class it as A. Because uh, this, this particular building here this chain here. I usually don't build that until I reach tier 5 just because there's got so many other good buildings I usually prioritize um, like the economic buildings, this building here, uh, the grand repository um, yeah I want to be increasing my heroes and that doesn't leave much room for these so once I've got enough build spots then I build this one and usually if I've at tier 5 I'm going to go for the tier 5 variant over the tier 4 so it's not like it's a bad unit I just don't prioritize it so I'd do the same thing with the uh, the Frostheart Phoenix and put it B. This one here, um, 
mainly for its debuff. I wouldn't spam them, but it's not a terrible fighter. Okay, and then the Arcane Phoenix. This one here, Doomstack. Uh, very good units. It's a huge step up from these other Phoenixes. It is a tier 5 unit, performs at a tier 5 level. These are one of the most annoying things to deal with if the enemy brings them. And if you've got a whole stack of them, they are so friggin' good. And you can make them nearly indestructible with hero traits. So just a really excellent unit. Definitely a Doomstack unit. Really, really fantastic. Okay, next up are Dragons. Okay, so... Sun Dragon first. I would put that as this is another tier four unit. Same problem with the the phoenixes. I'd, I'd probably put it as um, uh, tier four. Same thing with the um, no, it is tier four. I put it under B. Same thing with the Moon Dragon. Um, they're, they're good units, but dragons have a lot of weaknesses. Um, spamming them in the early game, I'd only really do that with Imric. Well, the early game is in tier four. Uh, apart from that, you know. Uh, Dragons, dragons are strong, but they also, like I said, they're strong, but they have weaknesses, um, and they're very expensive. Um, the thing is, you really want to be going dragons when you really get your economy going. By that point, you've got star dragons, and star dragons are doom stackable. So these ones here, while they're not quite as fast as these two, they have loads of health. They are super tanky. They're really, really strong. I've seen these guys pull off amazing victories. Um, the big downside to them is that they're just really, really expensive. But otherwise, just a f really fantastic doom stack that you can do if you want to do that. So the way to do that is with a dragon willed prince, um, a life wizard, and that's all you really need. Uh, if you want to put a handmaiden in there for a bit of extra resistances, you can do that, but you don't need it. Just go full dragons. Uh, or you can do that with Imric as well, give them even more resistance. And then we've got the Eagle Claw Bolt Thrower. Now, the Eagle Claw Bolt Thrower is not a great artillery piece in comparison to other factions' artillery. There's no way it competes with Hellstorm Rocket Batteries or Plague Claw Catapults, right? But, it's the only piece of artillery that the High Elf has. So, it's definitely going to get A tier. It's essential for a lot of your armies. You need to build this unit. Well, you don't need to build it, but you should build it. Because a lot of the battles that you're going to do are sieges. Um, now, of course, you could just bypass the walls entirely with dragons, but this is a tier 3 unit. You should be recruiting this at tier 3, at least until you get to this point. So, I definitely wouldn't put it here. No, 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 no. But, it's an A-ranked artillery, not because it's good compared to other races' artillery, but because you only need a couple of them because it fills a role that you should do, which is, you know, have the artillery. Now, we're talking about Mistwalkers after this. So, this is purely for Yvreth. Alright, so we got the Athel Tamara Faith Bearers. These are melee infantry. Okay. <laughs> you just got better ones, okay? Then you got the Sentinel of the Star Roll. Yes, Doomstack. They fulfill the exact same role as Sisters of Avalon, but you basically build the exact same sort of army where you have two Eagle Claw Bolt Throwers and the rest heroes and archers, and these have some of the highest range. They're only outranged by um, Way Stalkers, sorry, Way Watchers. Um, and that's if they're given uh, range bonuses, which oftentimes they are. But this is a really excellent unit if you want to doomstack with uh, Eltharion, because these guys here, they've got a low firing rate, but really high missile damage, which complements Break Upon the Walls really well, because he just replenishes one ammunition like every 25 seconds, not a, not a percentage of their ammo. So these guys here shoot at like 15, one every 15 or to 20 seconds, right? So... That ammo is almost replenishing as quickly as they're, as well, as slowly as they're shooting. Whereas if you've got a unit that shoots like five times a second, they run out of ammo and then they're sitting there waiting for a long time, waiting for, um, nobody shoots that fast anyway. Um, they're waiting for a long time for their ammo to, to kick in. That's just with Altharion though. But really, really good unit, the Sentinel of Astaril. I know the, the unit card's kind of cut off there, but I, I recognize it as the Sentinel. And then we've got the Spyro Guard of Toya Press. Really good archer unit. I'm going to put it as A tier. Um, not quite as good as Sentinels of a Star Rule, in my opinion, but still good. Um, I think these ones here are unbreakable as well. Not super familiar with them. I don't use them a lot cause just because I always gravitate towards these, but good unit. Then we've got the uh, the Skyhawks. I think they're a good unit. Um, Good-ish. I'm going to put them in B tier. And then we've got the Knights of Torgaval. Trash. Absolute trash. No, I'm just kidding. It's a Doomstack. Yeah, these are... Like, if you can get enough of them... Possibly one of the strongest doom stacks in the game, but it's only for your rest, and you will only get it super late in the campaign um, That you're very rarely ever gonna see it, but if you do end up doing it These are so goddamn strong these are uh, these griffins you could just make them nigh indestructible uh, Now if I was going to order these doom stacks in terms of strongest to large uh, strongest to weakest 
I would rank it this way. Okay, that's from strongest to weakest out of these Doomstack units. However, if I was to rate them in terms of how convenient they are to recruit, it would be Sisters first, then this one, then this one, then this one. So it's literally an inverse order of um, ease of use, because that's the only... These two here, I think, are like Tier 4 Doomstacks. Get Doomstacks if those are Tier 4. The rest of these are Tier 5. And this one here is like, m you need multiple Tier 5 settlements in order to get it. So that's like the least convenient. But that is by far, that's one of the strongest Doomstacks you can build in the game, period. But yeah, the, the High Elves have essentially five Doomstack, you know, non-hero based Doomstacks, which is probably more than any other race. Uh, and so, some some races combined even. So that's my listing of the, the High Elf roster there. Uh, let me know what your thoughts are. There's a lot of really powerful units in here, but you know, there's also a lot of really bad units. I think they've got a really sort of like spread out roster. There's always going to be some units that are trash because you can't just put every unit as A rank. And I'm sure some of these units here are maybe your favorites. And don't let your favorites, even if they're down low here, don't, don't let them be deterred. You know, sometimes I recruit these units down here just for a bit of flavor. It's not always just about Doomstacks, but in terms of the most valuable units in your campaign, these are the ones here that you can rely on very heavily, and will really, if you if you don't use them badly, will carry you through the entire campaign. You can go through the entire campaign just using these units here, without ever accessing any of these other ones, and you'll do you should do just fine. Um, I'll leave a link to this particular um, tier maker here, because I did look at your listings on the previous one uh, for the DLC, and maybe at the beginning of the next one, if, if, if this does well, um, I'll show what you guys thought were doomstackable and what you guys thought were trash. Um, let me know in the comments below what you think of that and what you think of you know, my rating of these particular units. Uh, I hope this helps you guys, you know, in building your armies on the campaign map on very hard battle difficulty legendary. But at the same time, I'm not trying to tell you how to play. Um, you should always do what you feel is best. But this is my guidance in terms of the units that will perform best for the high elves. Anyway, that's the end of this one here. Appreciate you guys, and I'll see you next time, fuckers. Bye.